the documentary filmmaking business, his name is widely recognized. His images from places like Afghanistan, Tanzania and India are breathtaking and his films from Bangladesh but also from the USA are award winning. He says however that he is rarely satisfied with his work. That's not really a feeling. I mean, I, I can get us. The reason is there's always another film to do right away. So when do I feel satisfied? The, one of the biggest satisfactions, and this is actually something to do with teaching, um, the way the workshops work here is that at the end of the week, everybody shows their stuff. And when you make a filmmaker, well, as a filmmaker, you never get to see your work with other people. So that's extremely gratifying. And that's really satisfying to sit there and watch people. So when I do these workshops, like say in Uganda, and we'll have 10 students and 10, there'll be 10 films at the end, and we'll bring all the people from, the, from the, the NGOs who the film are about, and they'll come and see it, that's extremely satisfying. But that's very unusual. That's not being satisfied with your work itself. That's just having another kind of a communal experience that we don't usually get. Over the last few years, his work is exclusively connected with NGOs around the world. I do believe that there's no, there's no need for poverty in this world. I believe that poverty is not a reflection on the people who are poor. It's a reflection on the way that the rest of us have created the world's structures. So, um, you know, anything I can do that can help alleviate poverty or alleviate hunger, these are the kind of films that I like to work on. I love to travel, and it's not just that I love to travel, I love a certain kind of travel. I'm much more comfortable in a developing country than I am in a developed place. I feel if I don't get some place where life is really the way it's been forever throughout human history, if I don't do that at least once a year, I feel totally unmoored, I feel totally um, disconnected from the world. So. You know, if you want to be in those places, well, what kind of films can you make in those places? Bill speaks perfect Greek and never hides his origin. The Guanese mu Jennifer can see New York. Okay, I've talked with Lama ya 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 this ke papu this if tane apo ti limno i ko yen tis manas mu apo ti poli ahi apo ti smirna ti i ko yen tis tu patera mu. He's a third-generation Greek-American and lives in L.A. In early 70s, he returns to Greece and spends several years here. During that time, he's a part of the team of Theo Angelopoulos and works on the Alexander the Great movie that goes to win the Venice Golden Lion Award. Europe is pretty developed. Um, I mean, I'd, I've always wanted to go to Albania. I have to say, that's been one of my... It's almost too late. I wish I had gone there many, many years ago. Um, you know, I wish it, you know, while Hoxha was still there, or that's what I really wanted. I felt that Albania was a place that, at least through the early part of the 90s, you could walk into Albania and it would be like walking back four or five centuries. So I regret that I didn't get there in time. But I don't know, Europe, I, I mean, I love Greece. I love Eastern Europe. I find it very interesting and I'd like to be there more. But as far as development work, I suppose there's microfinance, there's microcredit projects that are there that I could do something about. What part of filmmaking is his favorite? I really love the shooting of the films. You know, I really love the travel and the shooting of the films because that's when you meet the people. That's when you're having real experiences. I can't say that I like being in a dark room editing. Although, I recognize that that's the very important part of the film. That's where the film is actually put together and where it makes sense. Um, the first 20 years of my career, I didn't, well, yeah, over 20 years, I didn't do any editing myself. I would work with other editors, I worked as a cameraman, would deliver the footage. And, you know, with the advent of Final Cut Pro, and not even the first version, it wasn't until Final Cut 2 that I said, oh, I see a potential here. And when Final Cut 3 came out, that's when I really started editing myself. Um, and I do have a lot of respect for the editing part, and I'm very grateful. It's, it feels like I've opened up a whole different part of my brain. It's, I, it's totally different from shooting, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to start working that way. 
when you're shooting, a lot of the work that you're doing is really about, it's very time focused, it's about making the day, and a lot of it's about shortcuts, you know, say, oh, what's the best, how can we get this quickly, or how can we, you know, jump to the end, because we, we're only going to be here one day, we've got to get this whole thing in the one day, how can we do that? And so that, that's a certain part of your mind that, you know, is very exciting. It's kind of like dancing, it's kind of like playing music, it's, it's you know, on the seat of your pants, and it's, there's an excitement to it. Editing, there's nothing like that in editing. Editing, there's no shortcuts. You have to, you know, the one rule of editing, and it's so hard teaching students, it's so hard teaching the many people I help, is applying your ass to the chair. I met Bill Megalus at the main media workshops where he teaches for more than 15 years. The main lesson I've learned from Bill on a technical side is that when you're shooting handheld, you always want to be on a wide angle. That was that kind of that, that kind of blew me away right there because if you're shooting telephoto, your shot is going to be much less stable. But if you actually get in closer and set your lens to a wide angle, your shot's going to be much more stable. So that that right there solved a lot of my problems. I think the most important thing is probably to be prepared. <laughs> think about everything you need to do beforehand. What kind of shots you want to get. Uh, make sure you have all your equipment ready. And, you know, if you have all that stuff put together, then you'll be ready on the day of the shoot to focus on what you're actually doing. And, uh, getting the interview, um, getting the shooting that you, you need to do. What does he prefer, to make movies or to teach others how to do it? I prefer to, I prefer to play music in a band. That's what I prefer. But the fact is, I, I like both of them. If, I li if my life was just one without the other, I wouldn't be happy. Um, I find that there's six or seven of me. One of the me is a father, one is a, a husband, another one is a teacher, another one is a filmmaker, another one is an artist making art that really is not for anybody else's consumption. One of them is a, a, I play in a band. And, um, you know, there's a secret side of me that nobody else knows, and that's... I have, to, I have to listen to all those me's. So for me, teaching and life would not be, it wouldn't be good without both of them. I would hate to just teach, and I would hate to just make films. And Bill Megalo's advice to the young filmmakers. Don't do it. And I know that sounds terrible, um, because it's really changed a lot. I feel very fortunate that I managed to work in this business when it was a more humane business and when there were budgets that were enough so that you could actually make a good film. And the NGO films that I make, the only way you can afford to make them is if you do everything yourself. Now, I'm a good cameraman, I'm a good director, I'm a very good producer, but I can't do all of it equally well. The films are gonna suffer. I think I'm the quality is because I spent a ca so many years as a cameraman, I have a better shot at making a film as a one-man person than someone else. But it's not as good as when, it, as, as when everybody works together and it's collaborative. So it's very, very hard on the budgets today to make work that you can really be satisfied with. So my advice to young people starting out is, if you don't absolutely love it, Think, find something that you really love because in this business at this point you're going to be quite exploited. Everybody is going to exploit you. And if you don't love it and you can't find the joy in that, then you know, find something else to do. Yeah, it's a very cruel world that we live in. We live in a very mean and mean-spirited world. When I started out working in the, in the 70s, um, People understood that if you were a freelancer, you were very good, basically they were paying you, well, I don't know if you've heard the old joke, you know, when you, when you go, it's not a joke, but it's a, when you, go to a, when you go to a prostitute, you're paying them to go away. You're not paying them for the sex, you're paying them to go away, right? So with, with, with um, not that freelancers are prostitutes, but basically people, when they would hire you and pay your high fee, they were paying you to go away and not you know, be on your health, their health insurance, not be there when they didn't have work. And so because of that, the rates were enough money that you could live on them. Now the rates are so low for freelancers 
that's very tough. And I know many people who don't have health insurance who can't afford to pay for it. Myself, I've been working since the 70s. And in all that time, I've only had two years where my health insurance was paid. As a freelancer, I, pay, I have paid for my health insurance every single year since 1972. Well, in the beginning, when I was young, I didn't have any health insurance. But once I started, once I had a wife, and you know, once I started up, so starting really in the, in the late 70s, for over 30 years, I've paid for that. Now, as a freelancer, I have to make all that extra money. So now it's a very, people, there's, I say to people, my worst client, in the, in the 70s and the 80s treated me better than my best clients today.